1 Kings chapter 17, or the end of 16 and 17. You're giving me a look like I didn't tell you the chapter and, and the verse. So at the very end, verse 30 of, of chapter 16 is actually where we will look at through verse 1 of chapter 17. And we're going to think about faith. What is faith? How do you define faith? And how do you know if you have it? Chapter 16, verse 30 says this. Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord, more than all who were before him. And it came about as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he married Jezebel, the daughter of Ephbaal, king of the Sidonians, and went to serve Baal and worshipped him. So he erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. Ahab also made the Asherah. Thus Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel than all the kings of Israel who were before him. In his days, Hiel the, the Bethlehite built Jericho. He laid his foundation with the loss of Abiram, his firstborn, and set up the gates with the loss of his youngest son, Segub, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Joshua, the son of Nun. Now Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, surely there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. Let's bow in prayer. Father, we pray tonight that you would guide us through your word, that you'd help us to establish an understanding of what faith is, what the substance of faith is, who the object of faith is. I pray that you would help us to, to know how to apply faith in our own lives. And again, we thank you that uh, we, we trust tonight that you will, will not let your word return empty, but you will speak to each heart that is gathered here tonight. In Christ's precious name I pray. Amen. All right, what do you think faith is? How would you define faith? We've got uh, faith as a substance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. We find that in the book of Hebrews. But as we begin to look at lives that we find in Scripture, how do I begin to have faith myself? What is faith supposed to do for me? One little boy was asked about faith in Sunday school, and he said this. He says it's believing real hard in something you know isn't true. Now that, there's nothing farther away from faith than that. But many adults would say that faith is believing something that can't be proven. And that is not faith at all. Faith is something that is a confidence in someone or something that has been proven reliable. The more you know about the character or the background, the reliability of something, the more faith you can place on that thing. Faith is a confidence in someone or something that has been proven reliable. Now, when I learned to drive, my father allowed me. We had 10 acres that were behind our house, and my brother and I, my father would take all different things in as land payments. He would take a horse, a horse one time. He took a pig that I fell in love with one time, and he barbecued the pig. But one time, he, he took a, a, a car in. Now, we'd drive that car around. We drove a tractor all around. I drove a motorcycle for a couple of years, so I had a lot of ideas about how to drive a vehicle. Then we moved into to town, if you can call Manfred, Oklahoma, a town. We moved inside the city limits where they had streets and yards and sidewalks and all those things after living in the country where we didn't have any of those things. And I was just at that age of 16 or right before that age. And he decided that he was going to allow me to drive to school. And he put me behind the, the wheel of his brand new Silverado truck out in the front of our house, and he, he figured that I had it all figured out, but I've been riding a motorcycle for years, and motorcycles you have your clutch and everything, and I, I looked down in there, and I saw a couple of pedals, and I thought, well, maybe one of these is the, the clutch. All the old cars he got us had clutches in them, and I had never driven a, an automatic of any sort, and so he got me in there, and and I just knew that I needed to get it into gear quick before it died on me. I needed to hit the clutch quick, and I hit the gas quick. And so he put me behind the wheel. He said, okay, let's, let's go to school. It's about 8 o'clock in the morning. Had his coffee there and everything. And we were ready to go. And so I grabbed that gear shift and said, okay, ready? Okay. I went to, to drive, 
And then I hit the clutch, which was the brake, so we went like that, and I thought, well, I better hit the gas real quick. And I hit the gas, and we went We took off. And he, uh, all I grew up was gas pedal, but he must have grown up with foot feet. So he was screaming, spilling coffee, yelling at me, get off the foot feet, get off the foot feet, get off the foot feet. And I did not know what that was to get off of it. All I could do at that point was try to maneuver with the curve that was, uh, was coming up on us very quickly. But you know, my dad had no faith in me at all after that. He, he stopped us and he said, maybe you're not ready. Maybe you're not ready. Maybe you're not ready. I said, Dad, I think I can handle it. Just, just show me how this works down here. I think I can handle it. But he allowed me to drive that truck in the ensuing months all around the deserted streets of, of Manfred. It was one of those towns that rolled up at, at probably 8 or 9 o'clock at night. So for about an hour or so at night, I get to go out on the, the streets and drive it. With a, when I had a licensed driver next to me, it happened to be my friend that was, you know, he was less responsible than I was. But we were out there driving these streets of Manford, learning to do it better and better. We never saw any other traffic at all. But after a while, he had faith in me that I could drive. And by the time I got to be a young adult, it didn't bother him at all. Even after a couple of accidents, it didn't bother him at all to sit in that seat next to me and to trust me to drive. And faith is like that. Faith is confidence and the reliability, the character of that which you're placing your faith in. Faith is not blind. Faith is confidence that is grounded in reality. It is based upon, it rests upon, actually, the proven character and performance, and that is especially true with God. We do not have blind faith in God. We have faith in a God we know is reliable, a God we know that the Bible, which we have established through our study, that it is infallible, we have faith in the truth that we find here that God will prove reliable to the testimony he has given us in Scripture. So some things that we put our faith in, God is real, God is reliable, and that we can trust him. That is where our faith should be directed to. Now I want you to think about the walk of faith in the life of a person like Elijah. Now Elijah is met one of many people that we find in Scripture and Scripture contains the biographies of many people, and that is for a reason. They are portrayed there for a reason. Number one, they provide us with a role model that we can look at. It is somebody with skin on, with all the, the failing potential that we have, and we can look at their lives, and we can, can use that as a role model. And the second thing is, their lives should create a desire in us to want to be like them. It should show us that it is possible. There are possibilities for us to live the life of faith. It has been done prior to us. Hebrews chapter 11 gives us a wonderful hall of fame of people who have, have put their lives on the line, trusting God, have, have stepped out in faith and what God has done to bless them. So the Bible is given to us in a way that, that demonstrates the possibilities that can happen for the person who has a life of faith. It also leaves us without an excuse. After we've seen what God will do, what God wants to do, we can't sit there and say, well, God can't do it in my life. It takes away all of our excuses. And we may have many excuses today. You might say today that society is just too secular today for anybody to really live for God. Well, how would you like to be Moses? growing up in Pharaoh's household, being put in Pharaoh's school system, and trained with all the, the pagan philosophies of the day. And yet Moses turned out pretty good. Or, or Joseph, who was placed in prison for, for many, many years under the thumb of, of, of the Egyptian prison system. Yet he didn't give up hope, but came out the other side, trusting God and having a vibrant, dynamic faith. You might say today that I'm not talented enough for God to use me. God can take these other people's lives because they had something to work with. But I don't have anything to work with. But what about Gideon? God had to find Gideon hiding away in a threshing, in a, in a threshing floor because he didn't want the Midianites to find him. And God finds Gideon, and the first thing God says to him, oh, valiant warrior. That's the last thing he looked like. And yet God 
called him by what he was going to be. When we get up to heaven, it's going to be a shame if we show up at our locker and our locker says something like valiant warrior. And we, we think back at our life and say, man, I was anything but that. Yeah, but that's what God designed you to be. That's what God wanted you to be. That's what God put within you the potential to be if you would have ever just trusted him. I hope my name when I get done with this life matches what it shows on my locker, that I have lived up to the fullness of my potential. And you won't do that unless you live by faith in this world. Maybe you said, like many people might, that you've already blown it. There's no second chance. Well, tell that to Jonah. There's no second chances. Tell that to David that there's no second chances. There are second chances, and a, and a God of grace who gave us a first chance is a God of grace who will give us a second chance as well. Well, we find Elijah here. Elijah the Tishbite, as verse 17 describes him, says he was of the settlers of Gideon, and he suddenly appears on the pages of Scripture, just out of nowhere, boom, we have Elijah. Ahab comes up with some kind of lineage here, but then Elijah just shows up here at the end of, the end of this chapter. Stepping out of obscurity, and he confronts the reigning king of Israel about the king of Israel's sin. What a bold step. Where did he get the courage to do that? Just showing up out of nowhere, like Ross Perot, just out of nowhere. I'm going to run for president. Now here's Elijah, out of nowhere. I'm going to confront the reigning king about his sin. Where does he get that kind of courage? Now you see in verse 30 through the end of chapter 16 how bad Ahab was. I think verse 31 is a verse that would fit well today. It came about as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins that he did. It seems like a trivial thing today for people to do the things they do. That as you look at scripture you find out that it is a blatant sin. A blatant sin blasphemous sin before God, but it's a trivial thing to do that in life today. We have come so far in how far we have fallen. Well, Ahab erected an altar for Baal. When Ahab came to when Ahab came to, to reign, idolatry was already established in Israel. But idolatry was connected somehow to the real true God as they had just abused that worship. But Ahab set a brand new path. He came along and said, let's forget God. Let's go ahead and let's serve openly Baal and Asherah. You may, you may notice that some of our kids' cartoons, there's a she in our kids' cartoons that is based about out, out of this goddess. A she was a wicked, wicked goddess. Baal was a, the god of fertility, the god that you, know, you had to keep consistent with if you wanted your crops and your to grow and to be fruitful. And he built altars to both of these, these pagan altars, these pagan gods. He began to do something much, much uh, newer than what had been done before. He said, let's get God, that God, totally out of the picture. And let's repra replace him with other things. Let's don't just distort our worship of him. Let's just get rid of him altogether. That was brand new for Israel. And that is exactly what, what Ahab did. That is why he was so much more wicked. And, of course, he was inspired to do that by Hiller, I mean, by, uh, by Jezebel, who came along and encouraged him to do that and to take on this brand new direction for the country. Idolatry was firmly in place. And Elijah stepped forward and said, God does not like this. And Elijah was willing to step forward and, and to confront him about his sin. Much like John the Baptist did, and it cost John the Baptist his head. And it's going to cost Elijah much pain and suffering as well. Well, here is Elijah. I want you to look at the substance of his faith. faith. I'm going to give you three things to look at tonight. And I want you to think about what he was putting his confidence in as he considered the God he served. Number one, he was convinced that God was real. He was convinced that God was real as the Lord God of Israel lives. That's Elijah's statement. As the Lord God of Israel lives. Like Ahab, men are constantly trying to 
get rid of God. We have philosophies out there that are dominating schools, dominating media. You can't turn to a science channel without getting, getting hit with these philosophies that are out there. Here, as we approach the 21st century, they're getting more and more powerful in, in the play that they get in, in the philosophies of, our, of, of what people are most saying, those who have access to the airwaves. You have the philosophy of, of atheism, that there is no God. They don't blatantly say it so much as you won't find many TV programs that even acknowledge God. You'll find a, a few that, that, that may have popped up here lately that try to, but they distort theologically what God is. There's very few that are consistent with scriptural understanding of God. But atheism seems to be the, the, uh, the idea of the day. Evolution. Atheism, atheism says there is no God. Evolution says you can have a life, you can have life without God. God didn't have to start it or originate it. It just can happen by accident. And then you have humanism that says man is God. That man can do everything that is necessary. We don't even need God anymore. We can reach this fullness of potential by ourselves. With this Y2K thing on the horizon, it reminds me of, of I guess, Genesis chapter 11, where all men came together and decided they were going to live by one language. They were going to make it without God. They were going to produce a society that would intimidate God in the sense they were going to build their tower all the way up to him. And now we've, we've got this world that is concentrating itself smaller and smaller. And the reason we can do that is because of computer technology. Computers can, can cross the language barrier and, and make us able to do financial things. It makes the world all of a sudden be able to work together again on the philosophy that we don't necessarily need God. And I just wonder if God's going to stand for that this time. He didn't stand for it last time. And how God is going to react. And maybe this Y2K problem, this computer bug, is going to be somehow a response that God might allow to happen uh, to, to that. Well, uh, Elijah didn't have a problem with God. Elijah believed that God was real. And the world needs to see that. They're not going to see it in all the avenues that they're going to turn on a channel to, or they're going to turn on radio to. The, the predominance of that is not going to tell them the truth, that there is a God. They need to see that in our lives. You may have a great way of saying it, but they are not going to be convinced solely by your claim that God is real. They have to see the evidence and reality in your life. And if that's going to happen, you're going to have to let God change you. And the world's going to have to look at what they see and evaluate it as a reality that God alone could have caused that change in your life. And, you know, people are going to take notice. They won't listen to your arguments, but they will take notice when they see that your life is different. They'll take notice when they see that the hope is renewed and your hurts are healed, when they see that there's a brand new way of walking in your life. They will begin to question what has happened. You know, I might ask you a question tonight. What has truly happened in your life since you were saved that there is no explanation for other than the supernatural reality of God? What can you point to in your life? You know, you've got to have those things in your life if you're going to really impact the world. Now, there are people that know me before God got a hold of my life that question whether I would ever be able to stand before a crowd and tell people about anything they, it would be impossible. But then God gets a hold of a life and God begins to use the potential that he placed in there that we have been neglecting and, and putting down all these years. God begins to show himself real by making that miracle happen. What have you got in your life that, that is unquestionably something that can only be explained by a supernatural God? You might say, I believe in God. Big deal. Take a, take a poll. 95% of Americans, if you ask them the right way, will probably answer that the same way. You might also say that, that maybe I can point to a miracle. You know, there, there are Catholics that are pointing to, to this, uh, Mary was here, Mary was there, or there's a picture that's crying. We're told in 
one account where Lazarus and Rich Man both went to, uh, to, to a place where there was a gulf right between them. And the one, the rich man begged to go back and to tell his brothers. And the answer that came to him was, if they do not believe the law and the prophets, they will not believe if someone rises from the dead. And maybe if Jesus came to church next week and turned water into wine, maybe everybody in Hannibal would believe then. That is not the greatest evidence that they can see. Miracles can be can be duplicated by Satan in many ways to fool people. And he will do that with signs and wonders in the end times to draw many people after him. That is not the substance of faith. The substance of faith is how it is being an impact in your life in a way that people cannot deny it as they see the change that has happened. Do you have that, a deep, lasting, unchangeable evidence in your life? Are you beginning to forgive people like Jesus forgave people? Are you beginning to love people like Jesus loved people? Do you find out that your temper has been tamed? <clears throat> Do you find out that your, your gossiping tongue is no longer doing the destruction that it used to do? Now, there's a wicked rumor going around the church. That is the rumor that I've got my seventh child on the way. Now, I've heard that rumor six times before. But this time, it ain't true. At least it hadn't been told to me yet. That is, that is only a rumor. Has a, has a change become apparent in your life? C.T. Studd's father came to Christ under D.L. Moody's ministry. And he was a brand new person. He, he changed everything about himself. Very wealthy person, but he began to be a person who gave away to all these different causes and was very active in his church. And He was attending a meeting once for, for uh, D.L. Moody. And he, he is, uh, his horseman, the man who, who watched over all of his, his horse and got it ready and prepared, and who saw him on a daily basis, was asked, is it really true what has happened to Mr. Studd, the, the change that has gone on in his life? And, you know, what's happened to him? And in a simple answer, the horseman said, you know, the, the skin is the same, but there's a new man inside. You know, your skin, my skin's the same thing it was all my life. I, I know the skin changes every seven years, the cells or whatever, but the skin is basically the same. But God put a new person inside. And when God saves us, the Bible describes that as a new creation. And God puts someone brand new inside this skin that everybody's been looking at all your life. But God changes who you are. You no longer think the same. You no longer have the same desires and goals. All of a sudden, you have things that mean more to you that you, you didn't think about before. God does that in a person's life and makes a radical, supernatural change. The second thing we find, not only that God was real, but Elijah was convinced that he would give an account of his life before God. He was convinced there would come a day of judgment, and he would have to give an account of his life before God. He says, Shh. as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand. Do you know you stand before God tonight? For every action that you've done today, you're going to stand responsible and accountable before God for the decisions and choices you make tomorrow and how you carry them out. Do you have a sense of responsibility about that? Elijah came in, the very fact that he was standing before this, this reigning monarch and saying what he was saying showed that he had a tremendous sense of responsibility to what God had called him to do. Can God place that upon you, that burden, and you can be willing to go anywhere at any cost and say or do what God has called you to do? Elijah knew that if he did not obey God, confront Ahab, that he would stand accountable for eternity. He would have to answer for his unwillingness to stand against this pro-Baal movement that was going on, that was on the, on the rise. He didn't have the opportunity to be a silent protester. He could not remain uninvolved and hope that somebody else would do it. 
instead of him. You know, what answer do you think that you might stand accountable for, have to answer for, as you enter into eternity? And God says, in your generation, this was a problem. This was something that broke my heart. What did you do in obedience to me to confront that concern, that situation? Can you think of anything that you might have to answer for? You know, Elijah wasn't going to let that happen. And because he had faith, because he knew he was accountable and responsible, he had the courage to act in faith. And when you have courage to act in faith, you'll find that you're unintimidated by the odds. Unintimidated by the odds. And you're willing to stand alone. You'll find that you're unafraid of opposition. And you can see beyond mere majority and still see God. If you have the eyes of faith, those things don't affect you because God is bigger than any majority that might threaten you because of any activity you might do. So he knew he was accountable, and being accountable, he became available. And God is still looking for people who will be available when they are made aware that they are accountable. The Bible still says that we are ambassadors of God. The Bible still says that we shall be witnesses of God. We are like a suit of clothes that God desires to put on. God can come down and walk around here. He could, he could go all through every household in America. We think Santa Claus does it, but God could actually do it. He could come down and go knock on every door and tell them he's real, and they better get their lives in order. But God says, I'm going to do it to other people. And he's given the body of Christ the responsibility to do that. So we should be like a suit of clothes. And as I thought this afternoon about this suit of clothes idea, I began to think we need to be 90s clothes and not 70s clothes. So I got to thinking about 70s clothes. And 70s clothes, we all wore these slick shirts. And we don't need to be slick Christians at all. We need to be you know, straightforward, honest Christians. In the 70s, the pants were too tight. And we don't need Christians who are, who are tight. We need Christians who are generous and willing to give and to be a part of what God is doing. In the 70s, they had these platform shoes. They were fake. They were made to look you, look, make you look like you appear bigger than you were. We need people who are not going to be putting on any kind of deception, but we need to be a straightforward. And worst of all, in the 70s, there were these leisure suits. We need people who are going to work hard and do the work of Christ. Now, in the, the 90s, we have shrink-proof. We need Christians who are going to be shrink-proof. And we also need Christians who are going to be wrinkle-free because we are going to stand without spot or wrinkle before, before God someday. So we need to make sure that we don't allow the stain of sin to be in our lives. As God puts on a 90s suit of clothes, we need to allow him to do that. We need to allow him the freedom to reach into our lives at any point, at any time, to do what he desires to do and to put us on any time he chooses. I've heard it said that there is no greater ability than our availability. No greater gift you can give to God than your availability. Any ability you have that you're hoarding for yourself is meaningless to God. But anything that is available to him is a great treasure. Number three, and finally tonight, Elijah was convinced that the resources God had provided him were adequate. He was convinced that the resources, an eye of faith is convinced that the resources God will provide are adequate. James 5.17 looks back at Elijah's life and says this, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. He prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Elijah walked into to Ahab's throne room, or wherever he met him, and and told him, it is not going to rain or do for these years except by my word. Who is this guy? Coming in and telling me the rain is going to stop until he says something. And where did he come from? I've never heard of him before, never seen him before. And he's standing on my doorstep and telling me that it's not going to rain. It's not even going to do until I decide or I give the word that it does. How did he do that? Elijah was... It says here, a man of like passions in, in James chapter 5. 
That means he was, there was nothing special about him. He was like me or you. But it, although he had like passions to us, he didn't have like prayers to many of us. He was a man of prayer. And when you are a man of prayer, and, and James goes on to say that the prayers of a righteous man, or, or the effective prayers of a righteous man can accomplish much. When you have a prayer life like Elijah, even though he had a like passion like us, he was like us, but he had a prayer life that was different from many of us, you find that you begin to develop courage like he had. That was a byproduct of his prayer life. Not only courage, but confidence. He was able to exhibit the confidence because he had absolute confidence in the Word of God, and he carried that confidence from his prayer life into his willingness to confront somebody even like Ahab. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 16 and 17, warns us and says, Take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived, and ye turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. And then the Lord's wrath will be kindled against you, and he shut up the heavens that there be no rain. God's wrath was kindled against Ahab. Ahab had done beyond what anybody else had done. And I think America is beyond where we've ever been before. And God's wrath is kindled hotter today than it's ever been before against America. It is just whether we're at the boiling point, whether we're at the point where God is going to react to that. When you think of the word God's wrath, that word for wrath means his nostrils are flared. If you ever get an animal that its nostrils are flared, it's taking in enough oxygen to get those muscles ready and tuned to react, then you have wrath just about to happen. And God's wrath was kindled against Israel, and he shut up the heavens against them. And that is what he said he was going to do because of Ahab as well. And it's interesting to note that everybody in Israel was going to suffer because their leader had taken a certain direction and imposed that upon the nation and the nation had allowed it to happen. Elijah had faith, number one, because he knew what God had said. Number two, because he believed God would do what God had said. And number three, because he acted. He confronted Ahab with what God had warned him to confront him about. That is what faith boils down to in a simple definition. It is knowing what God has said, believing what God has said, that it will come true, and then acting upon it, no matter what the cost may be. Elijah didn't have anything available to him that we don't have available to us today. He had the Word of God. He had prayer. We've got the Word of God in even a fuller sense. But he also had faith to believe God, to take God at his word. He was convinced that God was real. He was convinced that he would give an account to God for his life. And he was convinced that the resources God would provide for him would be adequate enough for the need of his life. That is pretty much where faith begins and ends. It is not a complicated equation. We don't need Einstein to come and explain faith to us. It's really very simple. The hard part about faith is exercising it. The hard part about faith is, is putting the blinders onto a world that's distorting truth and, and calling out loudly their own direction and focusing in on God and His Word, praying to God as the source alone for our life and trusting God, a God who is unseen, a God whom we have not seen how it's going to play out, but we're just trusting God alone to be faithful to His promise. That's the difficulty of faith. And that is what each one of us is called to do. I want to ask if you would to bow your heads and close your eyes tonight. Darren's going to come and lead us in a hymn of invitation. I'm going to ask you tonight, is, is there any issue in your life that stands between you and God? If you're not a Christian tonight, that is a major issue. If you cannot confidently say that I know Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, Tonight you can do that as you leave. Just simply come forward and take my hand or Gary's hand. We can lead you in a prayer. A prayer that is all that God asks if it's genuinely what's coming out of your heart. Tonight you may have other needs 
that you need to deal with. You may want to come and just kneel at the altar, kneel on the, up against the front pew and pray about an issue. You might want to invite others to come and to pray with you. Just share with me what that need is or what you would like to have happen. And I'll ask other people to come and to spend time in prayer with you. Tonight you might want to, to join Emmanuel as a new church home where God can use you. Whatever your need is tonight, this is the time that we have set aside for you to make that public and to say yes to Jesus Christ. Father, we do pray in these moments that are ahead that you would control our hearts. We pray that you would direct our thoughts and remove every distraction. Help us to focus in on your will and upon Jesus Christ and the things that would give him glory in our lives. Help us to ask the hard questions and be willing to make the difficult choices. Again, we thank you for the opportunities of faith that you present before us an open door 